How many of you have heard Sally Klein O'Connor before? Or oh, just a few, maybe? Okay. Very good. So most of you, this will be the first experience. And I remember, um, you know, when I have calls from people, I really just ask the, the, the Lord to give me the insight, you know, whether or not they should come. And I really felt in my heart that this was the right opportunity. And so Sally came, and uh, she ministered so effectively. God used her in her music ministry. The uh, on her website, if you go there, the caption that is there says "Ministers in Song and in Healing," and that is so true. Uh, there's healing that flows from the music that God has given her that she uh, not only writes but that she sings. Sally um, is from. Uh, the uh, Los Angeles area, California. Uh, I believe you grew up there in California. And uh, she'll tell you some of her story, but she is uh, married to a man named Michael. They have three daughters. Uh, she is uh, Jewish, but as a completed Amen. Jew, is following Jesus the Messiah. Amen. And uh, has a ministry that she goes all around, uh, even to different countries, to, to sing and bring the message. So. I, what happens to me uh, in my heart, I, I love her ministry, uh, and Terry and I, last time she was here, we purchased a CD, and I believe it was called Play. You know one called Play? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with that CD, not only did she come and she uh, you know, ministered to us for half an hour, but we heard her you know, hours and hours on our CD. So we appreciate your ministry, Sally. Um, yeah, so welcome. Thank you for being here. All right. Welcome to Philadelphia.
that you would just open our ears and open our hearts and help us listen to what your voice is speaking to us today. So Lord, I thank you. I thank you for what you do in our lives that is so amazing and how you rescue us, Father, from the darkness and bring us into your marvelous light. So thank you, Father. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 So yeah, I'm Jewish, and I grew up Jewish, and I didn't go to church. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm convinced that God puts dreams in our hearts. <clears throat> he, like, weaves them into our DNA. And it says, actually, in Ephesians, I think it's in chapter 2, um, I'm just going to look real quick, so I don't want to say the words right, at least according to King James, or the New King James. Um, but it talks about these works that God has prepared in advance for us to do. It says, for we are his workmanship, which in itself is like a whole message. We're his workmanship. Okay, something to think about there. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That is Ephesians 2, verse 10. Um, I think those are the dreams that God weaves into our DNA that we can only step into when we come into relationship with God because they're not meant to be done by ourselves in our own strength. They're meant to be accomplished in partnership with God. They're dreams that are bigger than our thinking and our imagination. And, and so only with God can we walk in those dreams. So this is a story song about one man who had a dream and how that turned out for him. Overcame him one day. 
So 
God puts in our hearts. But even when we come to faith, we struggle to walk in those dreams because of the fears and the wounds that have occurred in our lives. And they keep us from walking in the freedom to walk in those dreams. I grew up in Los Angeles. I'm a native. <laughs> I'm still. I'm still asking God for some deliverance. I'm not a fan of LA, but there I am. And uh, when I was growing up, <clears throat> we lived originally for the first few years in a Jewish neighborhood. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody knew everybody's business. Um, and it was. It was. Um, I, I won't say it was idyllic. I mean, it was. It was a sweet time in my life. And I think that no matter what we've been through, there are times that reflect a little glimpse of the goodness of what God intends in our, in the creation, in our lives. But we moved when I was about eight, and we moved to a very different neighborhood. And before I had a chance to make friends, something happened to me that changed really everything about my life. Um, you could kind of say I was a Jewish American princess, okay? I didn't see anything wrong with that. I enjoyed it. My father was a florist, has been, he was a florist for 50 years. Um, but when we moved, we moved to a very different section of Los Angeles. And I, I had I had a more difficult time making friends. And before I made any friends, like I said, something happened. I was walking down the street to catch the bus to go to school, and a man had his dog out. And it was a, a German shepherd, as it happened to be. And I asked the man all the appropriate questions. You know, I asked him if the dog was friendly, if he'd ever bit anyone, or stuff like that. You know, and sometimes I think, it's not so much that we lie, but we hope for the best. The man was a school teacher. I didn't know any of this, you know. But I think that he, you know, he thought about his dog a certain way, and he didn't want to really believe the things that he was hearing on the, in the neighborhood. So he said his dog was friendly, and I, I started to pet the dog, and in a moment, the dog ripped open my face, and it took 100 stitches to sew my face back together. And it took about a month before I went back to school. And when I went back to school, you know, the scar pulled my eye down like this, and there was still blood in my eye. I still pulled my mouth down like this, so you can guess being the new kid still in school, what the kids gave me as a name. They called me Scarface. Now they called me Scarface for not a day or a week or a month or a year. For the next three years, I think I heard that name almost every day, even on the block. And pretty soon after I kept hearing that name and looking in the mirror, I began to think maybe that was the truth about who I was. You know, faith is a funny thing. We can have faith in negative ways, okay? So I looked at what I saw, and I listened with my ears, and I believed in my heart, and I became. And a scar face as a person is ugly, okay? And I was ugly. I learned how to be ugly. I learned how to speak ugly. I learned how to push people away before they ever could get near me. Because that's really the superpower of people who are rejected, isn't it? I mean, any of you have been ever rejected, okay? And I'm sure there's many here, right? You know? Amen, amen. All right? The superpower we develop over time is to assess the person who's approaching us and decide how we're going to respond. We judge the person, in effect, before we're judged, so that we can push them away effectively so that we don't have to be hurt again by them. In effect, actually, we've hurt ourselves. Amen. You know? And the truth is, is that after those kids called me that name, you know, and after that period in my life, it kind of went deep within me. I didn't know what that name, I didn't remember that name until the Lord brought it back to me. 
but I made choices from that name. And the choices I made damaged me so much more than those kids who were saying that name. You know? And when I came to the Lord, I was 27 years old. And one of the things you don't do as a Jew, okay, is ask Jesus to come into your heart, okay? That's not okay in the Jewish community. You know, that's the Gentile God. That's not the Jewish God. Even though it says directly in the scripture that he came for us. He came for us, he came for all of us, you know? So, out of my desperation, out of my pain, all the feeling on the edge of insanity at times, you know, I, I read a book by C.S. Lewis, a very famous uh, apologetic, a man of, who wrote apologetics. I wrote a book called Mere Christianity, and you'd think that I was reading this book, I would understand that the summing up of this book would have to do with Jesus, right? But I wasn't thinking. <laughs> I was thinking I liked C.S. Lewis because I read a previous book and I, I would take a chance on what he had to say there because C.S. Lewis had been an atheist till he was 30. And at the end of the book, C.S. Lewis says, you have to believe in the person of Jesus. And I'm like, no, I don't. And I threw the book across the room, you know, and I... And then in my heart, because I thought of myself as an atheist, I just railed at God and I said, how could you even be real? I've seen Star Trek, okay? I've seen all the galaxies, you know? How could you care about one person out of billions of people? So I was really angry, and I, I never opened my mouth, you know? It was all in my heart, and it was just like aimed at God, and I was so angry. And that night, he poured out his love upon me. Mm -hmm. Touched me every place, every part of my being. A love pure, a love without shadow or turning, a love that I couldn't help but know it was God. I came to the Lord in a Messianic congregation, actually, a few months later on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, a Day of Grace for me. And I just want to say He's so merciful. You know, He doesn't strip us of all our stuff right away. You know, he washes us, he cleanses us, and he begins to work our clay, right? In Jeremiah 18, it talks about the powder and the clay, and how God tells the, the prophet Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and see what he's doing with this marred piece of clay. And then God compares the marred piece of clay to us. And that the potter shapes that clay as seems best to the potter and not to the clay. And that God shapes us as seems best to him. Because he created us. And I think, you know, I gave my clay to everybody else's hands. You know, they poked me, they prodded me, my parents, my teachers, my friends, myself. All those hands, you know, trying to mold me. And the hands of the maker are pierced for me. And it's so hard to yield to those hands.
this shape of doubt. Touch me with your mercy, Master. Conform me to your skill. Me, the 
the love that he just poured out. You know? And I didn't do people for a long time because people were painful. People were hard. Amen. You know, Amen. it's like, God, me, yes, yes you, no. <laughs> but see, you can't get away from the thing that he wants us to learn how to love each other. That's Amen. so scary. Thank you. Right? Because people sometimes are reckless with Amen. their words, Thank even you. in church, you know? Thank it's you. Like, how do we love one another? That's Amen. impossible. You know, that first song I sang, uh, one, you know, well, <laughs> I would never have written that song at the beginning of my walk with him, you know, because it's like, that's impossible, God. How do you make that happen? You know, and yet it's Jesus' ongoing prayer for us. Thank that you, we Jesus. will love one another. Thank you, Jesus. And that we will be one as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. Amen. The word for that in Hebrew is echad. And it's a word in marriage, you know, it's where the father, you know, it's where the man, you know, and the woman cleave to one another and they become one flesh. That word in Hebrew is achat. So it's two individuals, two different people coming together and becoming one. How does that happen? You know, well, I mean, we know physically how that happens, you know, but, but how does that happen? You know, when we're so diverse, we're so ripped apart, we're so separated, you know? by wounds and culture at times, you know? And I'm no different, very separated by my culture in many ways, you know, very much taught by my culture. But then we come into relationship with Jesus and we're called to be of kingdom first and then culture. First kingdom and then culture, and even to bring kingdom into our culture. Amen. Okay? Because our culture is an earthly thing. Amen. You know? But the kingdom is God's thing. Thank you, Lord. So, you know, one of the things the Lord did in my life was he started teaching me how to forgive. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't grow up in forgiveness. Okay, are you kidding? In my culture, nobody forgave anybody, okay? Everybody held a grudge forever until they died. You know, my mom had a breakup with her best friend of 30 years, you know? That never got healed. Okay, it never got healed. You know, so I didn't learn how to forgive until the Lord intervened in my life and he began to show me what forgiveness really was. Because even though we say, you know, we're forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross, sometimes that's still abstract to us. And it was abstract to me, you know. But he began to show me, especially with my father, first. My father had issues of rage when I was a child, and I hated him. And when I came to the Lord, the Lord had to deal with my heart and help me see him the way he, the Lord, sees him. And the way that the Lord saw him was it was like a man who's trapped in a monster. Amen. You know, and he has mercy for the man who is trapped in the monster. He has mercy for his creation trapped in the, in the jaws of sin and death. Amen. He has mercy for us. But we have a real problem expressing that mercy to people who have hurt us, right? Amen. Because we might get hurt again, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, those people are dangerous. Or they might not respond appropriately, right? But here's the deal that I'm learning, and I'm, I'm in process, man. I am very much in process. I am learning to rely on the love that he has for me. Amen. Yes, Lord. Right? Yeah. See, the, the thing is, we start with a vertical relationship with the Lord, right? And that has to be really strong in order for us to do this. Amen. Okay? Even here, among ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Let alone out in the world. Amen. Okay? <coughs> To love with his love, not with our very petty, fickle, you know, yes, love, very compromised you, love, okay? Yes. I get easily offended love, okay? Yes. But his bountiful, merciful love. Thank you, Jesus. This is a whole other thing. So the Lord broke down the wall between me and my father. And then he began to work on my heart about Germany. And for every Jew alive, 
Germany is a place of negative feelings. Because of what happened in the Holocaust, uh, six million Jews were killed simply because they were Jews. And if Adolf Hitler would have had his way, he would have exterminated all Jewish people racially from the planet. So the Lord began to work on my heart because that was something I grew up with. And he began to teach me to see differently with his mercy and his love and his forgiveness. I am not the judge of all the earth. And to let go and to know that I am so loved that I could love my brother, Jürgen Schmutz, who was born in Dachau, and whose, whose, whose whole soul was so under shame that he had to flee Germany. He left Germany when he was 18 and moved to Canada. I never given thought to how the Germans might feel about what happened in the Holocaust and their history of the Holocaust that is forever with them if the Jewish people have it their way, right? Because we're forever indicting them. And there is no forgiveness. But you see, in Jesus, there is forgiveness. You see, in Jesus, he tells us to look at no one the way we looked at them once through a worldly lens. We look at them with mercy and kindness. And that doesn't mean that we, you know, we let somebody who perpetrated evil and who's still a perpetrator perpetrate that same evil against us. But we forgive them and we can also be wise. Okay? We can forgive them and release them from our judgment and pray for them. But we don't have to necessarily invite them into our lives again. I want to say that because that's important. <coughs> The Lord was calling me to love a people who, by my people's standard, was an enemy. Some of them not even sorry. What about that? <coughs> well, then we have to deal with what Jesus did on the cross. He forgave the very people who were crucifying him. Amen. He asked the Father to forgive them. Amen. Even as they were crucifying him. Even Stephen said, as they were stoning him, do not hold this against them. What do we do with that? I went to Germany in 2007. to some of the camps, the concentration camps where my people were killed. I went to Bergen Belsen, Anne Frank and her sister were killed there, a very famous place. And I was so angry, you know, I had never been to Germany, never thought I would ever go. And there were all these memorial stones of mass graves, 2,000, 2,500, 1,500, whatever. And in between these stones were all these pink flowers. And the pink flowers were really beautiful, but they made me really angry. Because in my heart, I just went, how can there be beauty in a place like this? Why, God, would you have beauty in a place like this? And I couldn't wrap my mind around it. And the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I'm a redeemer. How about you? Excuse me just for one moment. Could we turn off all the electronic devices? Something that's on this way. So we began a project in 2009 that's called the Tour of Roses, and it's a project of healing and mercy and reconciliation. And I thought first it was all about the Holocaust, and it was all about Germany and Poland and countries affected by the Holocaust in, Euro in, in Germany, in Europe. I was going to say Germany. Europe. 
up, you know. And I thought, okay, God, I can do this if this is what you want. And what we did was we brought long stem red roses to the people in the towns where the concentration camps were. And we began to just share with them the love of the Lord and tell them even that we were Jewish, some of them. Some of us on the team were Jewish. And people wept and they, they hugged us and they said many things to us. But then the Lord expanded it and he brought it to Belfast and the conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics <coughs> at the Peace Wall. And then he brought it to Israel, to Bethlehem and the West Bank, to Bethlehem and Jerusalem, and we brought roses there, long stem red roses as a way of, ex of, of expressing the extravagant love of God for free. And so we saw some of the Palestinians actually commit their lives to God. And then lastly, the Lord has been bringing us to the Native American people in Canada, they're called the First Nations people. And they're so wounded. And this song got written for them. And I felt like I should share it because there are parallels between what is going on with them and what is going on with the young people in our lives right now. And the song is just called Grace. And it got written last year as we were preparing to do our first outreach to the Native American or the First Nations people, it got written as our youngest daughter was going through stuff that was very, very painful and difficult for us. We were afraid we would lose her. And you see, I wonder what will save the people of this generation, the young people. We have to learn how to love one another. Amen. 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 Not yeah. be nice. I'm not talking about nice. Amen. I'm talking about finding the love that God has poured out in our hearts to love each other. Thank you, Lord. To forgive each other.
those who raised your hands, I just invite you to pray with me, okay? Just pray with me. God, you are, you are amazing. And I know that you see me today. 
And I lift my hand to you, I lift my heart to you, and ask you to forgive me my sins, Lord. Things I did knowingly and things I did unknowingly, God. But ask you to forgive me and wash me and cleanse me from my sin, Lord. I thank you for Jesus. I believe he died for me. And ask you to help me believe even more, Lord, that he died for my sins and he rose from the dead. And I won't be dead in the grave, but I will be alive with him as I open my heart up and ask you, Lord, to be Lord of my life, to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I want you. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to set me free. I want to know your love. I want to taste your goodness. I want to walk with you in this life. I want, I want you, Lord, in my life. I need you in my life. So, Lord, be Lord of my life, Jesus. Come and be Lord of my life. And make a change, a change in my heart, Lord. I ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. And maybe some of you, some of you are a little stuck. There are people that you are angry at, people that you were hurt by. In this song, I just want you to listen to the words, and then I want to sing it with you. Maybe there are people you have to forgive. Maybe there's a bitterness in your heart that's taken root and that blocks his love. And you want his love. I just invite you to, to lay it down. Lay your unforgiveness at the altar. Lay your bitterness there.